this presentation is the last of the seven churches. Francois will now take us on tour to Sardia, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I trust you will enjoy it as much as the first two lectures. I'm having a sip of water at a place called Sardis in Turkey. This is the fifth of the seven churches of Revelation. It's quite an experience to walk through the remains of these once famous cities. You feel the place, you see it and you even smell it. And as you stroll along, you allow your memory to recap what happened here many centuries ago. Under a ruler named Croesus, Sardis became famous for its wealth. Later on, the city became a proverb for luxury and prosperity. Having conquered the restless Greek states, Croesus became arrogant with power. But then he heard of the successful conquests of Cyrus the Great and Croesus got worried. You're looking at an inscription of Cyrus that I discovered at Pasargade in Iran. During this time of panic, he was reminded of some good advice given him some time ago. The Athenian lawyer, Salon, told him not to be overconfident. So he took precaution and consulted the sacred oracles of Delphi. The answer came, if you cross the river Hollies, you will destroy a great empire. Neither Croesus nor the sacred oracles of Delphi studied the prophecies of Daniel. Tell me, who was to be the next world empire after the Babylonians? Not the Lydians, as Croesus thought, but who? The Medo-Persian Empire. When I looked at the ancient Acropolis where one of the wealthiest men of antiquity lived, I thought of the accuracy of Bible prophecy. Croesus did cross the Hollis River and he did destroy an empire, but it was not the Medo-Persian Empire, it was his own. We are at the museum at Ekbatana in Iran. History tells us that Cyrus the Great transported all the wealth of Croesus to this particular city. I wish we had more time to explore the very interesting facts about this city of Sardis. Unfortunately, we will have to move on and discover the prophetic time slot of the Church of Sardis. According to the chronology, we are now dealing with the time of the Reformation movement. Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 To the angel of the Church of Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars. I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When this letter was read to the congregation of Sardis, urging them to wake up and be watchful, they knew exactly what the Lord was trying to tell them. You see, during the time of King Croesus, people thought their city was impregnable. But one night while they were asleep, the enemy climbed up the steep summit and captured the city. What a story! Let us never feel spiritually complacent. Let us never fall spiritually asleep. The devil may overcome us by sudden surprise. While the reformers aimed at only reforming the church, the radical reformers, not satisfied with half measures, urged a complete return to the apostolic faith of the Bible. The radical reformers rejected the unscriptural practices such as infant baptism. And because they began practicing baptism by immersion, they were called the Anabaptists, which means rebaptizers. How did the reformers react to this? 
The established Protestant churches declared that to rebaptize was heresy and they began persecuting the Anabaptists. We don't have a very proud history as human beings. Reformation scholar Roland Bainton writes, Anabaptists spread in Switzerland, down the Rhine Valley and into the Netherlands. The documents now in process of publication reveal an amazing dissemination and indicate a real possibility that Anabaptists, if unimpeded by the sword of the magistrate, might have become the prevailing forms of the church in Germany. However, the Great Commission did not succeed. Persecution turned the Anabaptists into the Church of the Remnant. In 1611, the Anabaptists established their first church in England. You're looking at a picture of the burning of Anne Askew and others at the stake. On the Isle of Patmos, John saw that this was the way the great Protestant movement would go. Come with me to Bunhill Fields Burial Ground in London. This is where all the outcasts were buried. Even if you wrote the immortal words of the hymn When I survey the wondrous cross and the Church of England didn't like you, you had to be buried here. Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe, was also buried here. Why? He disagreed with the church and they didn't like it. Have you heard of John Bunyan? Let me show you his tomb. He was a Baptist dissenter. In 1660, he was cast into the Bedford prison for conducting a religious meeting without permission from the state church. I was impressed with this relief on Bunyan's tombstone. Here you see him while he carries a big load of sin on his back. Can you perhaps identify with him? Let's look at the positive paradigm shift on the other side of the tombstone. Here he places his big burden of sin at the foot of the cross. What a relief! What a message. He is appealing to us to follow his example. While in jail, John Bunyan wrote that immortal book called Pilgrim's Progress. In Revelation chapter 6 and 9 to 11, the Sardis period is fittingly characterized by the opening of the fifth seal. Listen to the symbolic cry for help from the martyrs of this period. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord! holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Verse 22 gives us the response. They were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Because the church of Sardis, the Protestant cause, rejected new scriptural light, God was forced to pass them by. He brought his special additional light to the Philadelphian church. Listen to his call to the honest ones in the church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3 verses 4 to 6 Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After I left the ruins of ancient Sardis, the appeal that God made to this church kept ringing in my ears. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God help you and me to listen when the Holy Spirit speaks to us concerning the wrongs in our lives. If we heed, we will be saved. But if we turn a deaf ear, we will be lost. You are looking at an ancient pillar at Philadelphia. Many centuries ago there were some Christian paintings on the inside, but today you can hardly recognize them. I had a blessed experience the first time I visited here. An elderly woman from the city walked up to one of the ladies in our group and hugged her lovingly. I shall never forget it. What she did was a practical illustration of the meaning of the church, namely brotherly love. History tells us that the Christians of Philadelphia suffered much under the persecuting activities of the Jews. 
The city seems to have been near a great fault line and suffered many earthquakes. The Greek geographer writing in AD 20 said, Philadelphia is full of earthquakes. With this in mind, God sent them the following comforting message. Revelation chapter 3 verses 7 to 12. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claims to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Strong pillars in ancient cities collapsed when shaken by earthquakes. But God sent a comforting message to the Philadelphians, telling them of a land of eternal stability and safety, a land without sudden disasters. And this is still God's message for you and me who are subject to sudden disasters and disappointments. Take heart, God is preparing for us a bright and safe future. In this letter we are looking at the period of the Christian church from 1734 to 1844. This was the time of the great religious awakening and the missionary movements that followed. The church became the key, the open door to a new age of personal piety and missionary expansion like never before. The sad age of dead orthodoxy yielded to the flames of revival. Jonathan Edwards kindled the first sparks. He preached a series of sermons on righteousness by faith in 1734 in his church in Northampton, Massachusetts. The revival that began in his own church spread like wildfire to the adjoining regions. But that's not all. At Oxford University something exciting happened. In 1729, John and Charles Wesley and a few others joined to form the Holy Club. These serious Christians met in an upstairs room where they prayed and encouraged one another in living holy lives. On May 13, 1738, a unique experience came to John Wesley in London. It happened at Eldersgate Street, not far from St. Paul's Cathedral. A plaque tells the story. Wesley had been seeking peace of mind, assurance of divine acceptance, but without success. But upon entering a chapel here and listening to the reading of the introduction to Luther's commentary on Romans, with its emphasis on righteousness by faith, he suddenly felt his heart strangely warmed. With Christ in his heart and in his sermons, John Wesley's preaching produced marvellous results. He travelled by horse and average day saw him travelling 15 to 20 miles and preaching four or five sermons. Altogether, he rode 250,000 miles and preached 42,000 sermons. The state church did not like what he was doing, but God certainly did. The day I visited the Wesley Museum, I thought of the words to the Philadelphian church, what he opens, no one can shut, Revelation 3.7. No one could shut the door that God opened for the Methodists to spread the good news of Christ our righteousness. The Philadelphia period gave birth also to the great missionary expanse, beginning in 1792 with William Carey's departure for India. 
Known as the father of modern missions, his work included the translation of the Bible into 42 languages and dialects. When you read the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, you notice, as in the case of Smyrna, there is no rebuke. Why? You see, God's greatest concern is for the saving of souls. And if we occupy ourselves with this important work, we will not have time for any selfish pursuits. I had one last look at the remaining crumbling pillars from the time of ancient Philadelphia. You and I are also crumbling because of age and sickness. But then I was reminded of the message that was delivered right here some 2,000 years ago. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Revelation 3 verse 11. We have come to the end of a very long but interesting journey throughout Turkey. Our last visit will be to the ancient site of Laodicea. There is a wealth of historical and archaeological detail at this site. Unfortunately, I will only be able to give you a fraction of it. The meaning of the name Laodicea has great significance. The judging of the people. Can you still remember when the great heavenly judgment began? 1844 So the letter to Laodicea is actually a message for you and me. How come? Well, it covers the time slot from 1844 till the end of the world. This is the last message to the inhabitants of this planet. The acceptance of it means life. The rejection of it means death. The warm mineral springs of Laodicea had given rise to the world-famous medical school. Associated with the school was also a heathen temple. The Greek god of medicine that was worshipped here was called the Great Physician. The medical school of Laodicea developed the Phrygian eye powder which became famous in the ancient world. It was made of dried mud from the thermal springs and emulsified with mineral oils and chemicals. Eventually, it would dry into fine powder. Then, when mixed with water, it would form a healing poultice. Historians tell us that thousands journeyed to Laodicea to benefit from this eye salve, the mineral water and the hot and lukewarm baths. When we consider the Laodiceans' wealth, the black garments and the famous ointment industries, we cannot help but be impressed with God's letter to them. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Verses 18 to 20 I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Tell me, what was the Laodiceans' problem? Well, they thought they had arrived spiritually. They were content, happy with their spiritual condition. They felt that the truth they had made them righteous. May God help you and me never to feel spiritually content because then there is nothing that he is able to do for us. May God help us to always realize our wretched condition and seek for a daily conversion. What kind of solution did God offer the lukewarm church of Laodicea? What message did the self-righteous members of the church receive who spent too much of their precious time in this ancient amphitheater? 
Verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so that you can see. There is only one solution to the self-righteous, self-sufficient problem of the Laodicean church. The knocking Jesus must be allowed to enter their hearts. Let me introduce you to the thermal waters of Laodicea. I must warn you that it is not as tasty as one would like it to be. My son-in-law tried to swallow it, but he couldn't. And then I also tried to swallow the water, but it tasted too terrible. In order to solve the problem, I did something which is called bad manners. I spat it out. And the Bible uses this crude behavior of getting rid of tepid water to illustrate God's distaste for lukewarm Christians. This experience made the message to Laodicea and to myself extremely real. Revelation 3.16 So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I wonder how you and I taste in God's mouth. In the foreground you have the warm water. By the time it gets to the valley below, it's lukewarm. In the far background you have snow-capped mountains. When one is cold, one is prepared to change one's situation by putting on something warm. When you are hot, you are also prepared to change your situation by taking off some clothes. But when you enjoy body temperature, when you are lukewarm, you are not inclined to change. In the parallel prophecy of the seven seals, the sixth seal extends through the period of Laodicea. The seventh seal ushers in the second coming. Do you realize where we are in the prophetic stream of time? The message to ancient Laodicea with its lukewarm water is for you and me. It's a call to repent. We have to come closer to the source, Jesus Christ, and become spiritually a little warmer. Revelation 3 verse 20 Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This gracious invitation is best illustrated in Holman's Hunt's immortal painting, The Light of the World. It was painted in 1893 and hangs in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Jesus is graphically pictured in a night scene with a lighted lantern in his left hand while he knocks on the door with his right hand. The house represents the human heart. Jesus does not force an entrance. He simply stands and knocks and pleads. He will enter only if we open the door. I asked Melek, our Turkish guide, to knock on one of the Laodicean doors. She did and a friendly lady opened the door. She invited us in and guess what? We ate together. What an unforgettable experience in Laodicea. When I looked at this clock, I noticed it was almost noon. To me, this was so typical of the time slot in which we live. It's almost 12 o'clock. It's almost time for Christ to come. We had the privilege of introducing this Muslim guy to the gospel. When she heard the gentle knock of Jesus, she opened her heart and allowed him to enter. Have you heard a gentle, persistent knock? at your heart's door lately. It's Jesus, your friend. He longs to enjoy your continual friendship. When you allow him into your life, you'll become more kind to those around you. Friends, have you noticed what the hour is on the prophetic time clock? Yes, Francois is right. It is almost time for Jesus to come. This time he will come as king and judge. How will you stand before him? Please make sure that your sins are forgiven and your name is written in the book of life. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we can hear your voice speaking to us as you knock on the door of our hearts. Give us the courage to let you in so that we can have peace with you. In Jesus' name, Amen.